Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Top Vietnam. You've just seen some beautiful images from uh, two movies, very famous. The uh, first one is The Quiet American from 2002. You may have remembered starring uh, Michael Caine and Brendan Fraser. And the second one is a more recent one in uh, the box office, Salt, starring Angelina Jolie. Now today in our Top Vietnam, we're lucky enough to welcome uh, to our show the uh, director of these two films. He's Philip Noyce. He's an acclaimed uh, Australian filmmaker in Hollywood, and he's here with us today for a special talk. So let's welcome him. Hello, Philip. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're he we've heard that you're here this time to join the Vietnam International Film Festival. So how is that going so far? It's uh, a lot of films to watch. You know, I'm used to making movies and watching my own films. In fact, I've spent the last two years in New York City working on SALT, which of course came out around the world and in Vietnam uh, just recently. So I have been by myself in a little room, you know, just watching the same scenes of Angelina running, jumping, firing guns and doing all those things. And now suddenly they've let me out of my cave and they've put me in another little room. But now I get to watch more than Angelina. I have to watch uh, movies from uh, all over uh, Asia. So it's been quite a change, but also a big pleasure. You're, you've talked about how you spend a lot of time in one room watching a lot of movies. Do you uh, remember specifically how many movies the jury had to watch in order to make a decision? Yes. Uh, in the uh, feature film category, we had uh, 10 movies to watch. 10 movies in all. Wow. All, yeah. So the audience is probably very um, curious about what your opinion is on the general uh, kind of quality of the films that you've watched this year. Well, of course, um, I'm not a film critic. I'm a filmmaker. Um, so uh, I'm more in that sense, I'm, I guess, uh, halfway between a critic and an audience, a real audience. So I just watch the movies to see which ones uh, give me pleasure. And um, I got a lot of pleasure out of these movies, I must say. I mean, uh, every country, of course, uh, has a different way of looking at the world and filmmakers in different countries, even though they might be neighbors. For example, you know, Thailand is not far from Vietnam, but they're a long way away in terms of how they look at the world. Malaysia is near Indonesia, but they may as well be Mars and, uh, and the moon compared to the way that they see things. So it's been very interesting to, in five days, just to see the different ways in which people look at the world and also to see the different ways in which uh, the same stories keep popping up. For example, I would say that uh, this year we've seen a lot of films about strong women and not so strong men. It seems like the men are struggling to keep up with the new strong woman. Uh, in, in 2010 movies. That that's, seems to be a theme, that the men are kind of sad sack losers mm -hmm. and the women have got, you know, uh, uh, all the strength and, uh, and the men are just, just, just able to keep their head above water while the women, you know, are, are doing fabulous things. That was a theme running through so many different movies. Right, exactly. So despite the um, number of movies that you saw, there were certain motifs running through them. Um, now going back to the movie that we saw right in the beginning of an extract of uh, The Quiet American, which uh, you are very famous for here in Vietnam. Um, you made that film eight years ago. So coming back to Vietnam now, how do you find it different or the same to eight years ago? Well, um, I haven't been to Ho Chi Minh City yet. I go there on Sunday. so. I'm not sure how that city has changed, um, but Hanoi has changed an enormous amount. Uh, when I first came here back in the early 90s, um, you know, it was uh, not so much motorbikes. They were still changing from bicycles to, to motorbikes. Uh, now we see the change from motorbikes to, to cars, and some of them very expensive cars. So materially, there's a big change. There's a big change in the, in the, uh, um, uh, the way people are dressing, the, 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 the money that they're spending on entertainment, on restaurants and so on. It seems like a very prosperous city. Uh, of course, the city has grown enormously. Um, the outskirts of Hanoi now, you know, are all new buildings and it feels like you're in Los Angeles, not Hanoi, in a way. But these are all superficial things. 
the thing that hasn't changed is the spirit of the Vietnamese people. It's the same. And the beauty of Hanoi is the same. And the beauty comes not just from the combination of, uh, of uh, Vietnamese and French architecture, but it comes from inside the Vietnamese people, and particularly people in Hanoi who have just a special way of moving, which is like a ballet dance. And that's so beautiful to the outsider. You know, this is a, Hanoi is a city that's entranced people, mesmerized them for centuries. And it's still doing that, and it still did that for me when I came here. And it certainly became a subject uh, in your uh, film, The Quiet American, which had become very famous. And uh, people often wonder, why is it that you chose uh, Graham's uh, best-selling novel, Graham's Greene's best-selling novel, um, and, and the, the, the movie was based on this? The movie chose me. The novel chose me. I went to, uh, <coughs> to buy a copy of, um, of Ho Chi Minh's Prison Diaries. And it was in a green cover. And so I, I chose the wrong book. I picked up the wrong book, and they wrapped it up and put it in a, uh, a paper bag. And I was on a train down to Hoi An, from Hoi to Hoi An, uh, I think it was. And um, I pulled out the book to read this, uh, the, uh, the Quiet American again. I'd read it uh, in, in university in Australia. And um, I'm sorry, I pulled out the book to read. I pulled out to read Ho Chi Minh's prison diary. Thinking that you were. Yeah, thinking that I was going to read that. And I discovered that it was a book that I'd already read in college, The Quiet American. So I started to read it again. Um, and now, uh, you know, there I was, uh, an outsider in Vietnam. Uh, and suddenly I saw, and, and it was after the American War. Um, so we ha we ha I, I read it with different eyes. Um, and I wasn't now in a, in a university, I was sitting, I was like Fowler, the central character, uh, played by, by Michael Caine in, in the movie that I made. In a way, I was the European outsider. And so I saw the book completely fresh again. And with the hindsight of, of knowing what happened between the 50s and the 90s, the book spoke to me and took me and it said to me, you must make a movie out of this again, even though Joseph Makowitz had already done that back in the 50s. Of course, the problem with Joe's film was that he changed Graham Greene's story. Um, in, in the original story, it was the young American, Alden Pyle, played by Brendan Fraser, who was responsible for sponsoring uh, terrorism in Vietnam. In Makowitz's, story, in Makowitz's version of the film, he changed it so it was the Vietnamese people who were sponsoring the terrorism. A big difference, huge difference, completely uh, subverted what Green was trying to say. So I felt that, you know, given what we'd seen in history and the changes, it was time for a new version. So the movie, the movie spoke to me, the book spoke to me. Exactly, and it chose you too, as you said, completely by chance, thinking that you were reading something else, actually. Well, maybe it was Ho Chi Minh that, 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 that made that switch, you know. <laughs> exactly. There's a movie that has been made that has the wrong perspective, so there needs okay, so to be... If you're going to buy my prison diaries, you'll get... I'll trick you. You'll think you're buying the prison diaries, but really you've been given this, this, this uh, message. In a way, a present, not a message. Exactly. When you made this film in Vietnam, what were some of the challenges and uh, what were some of the things that you found most interesting? You know, um, we thought there would be big challenges, um, but... The, the, all of the big challenges uh, disappeared. Um, you know, the Vietnamese government were very, very helpful in helping us to find locations and getting people to cooperate with the production. You know, we thought that we wouldn't find the, the technical help here in Vietnam, but we didn't realize how uh, uh, efficient and, and uh, um, you know, Vietnamese filmmakers were in every area, in costumes, in, 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 in makeup. In, in acting, um, in, in uh, assistant directing, and so on. Um, I f was lucky to find uh, one of the great world directors, uh, uh, Dan Yat Min, who was able to cast and, uh, and, and direct parts of the movie as my second unit director. You know, he's a fine, fine director, and he was responsible for creating the ambience and the wonderful scene outside uh, the, the Continental Hotel in the climactic scene near the end of the movie where the bomb explodes and, and, and 
and everyone uh, is left devastated by the effects of this bomb. Well, that was the work of Dan Yat Min, um, um, who had lived through the American war and, and, and knew it very personally. He'd lost his father to a B-52 bomber. Um, and uh, so, so he was able to invest greatly. And so every, everything was surprising, surprising in a positive way. We received so much help. It was like uh, the Vietnamese people and the Vietnamese film industry also wanted to write Graham Greene's uh, story, to get the right version out there. Because, you know, it, it, before we made the film, ever since Joe Mankiewicz's f film, you could buy that book uh, in the square in, in, in Ho Chi Minh City. Everyone was selling it. But it was almost like they wanted the movie to, to be the right version of the book. I'm now talking a little bit about uh, the film itself. Here in Vietnam, people were really amazed by the imagery used in there, and especially the music as well, because um, as opposed to choosing a dedicated film score writer, you chose uh, a Vietnamese composer. Um, why is that? Well, no, it wasn't a Vietnamese composer. Uh, actually, the, the overall composer of the, of the music was Craig Armstrong, who had done The Bone Collector with me and, and also had done Romeo and Juliet with Basil Luhrmann. But we did use a lot of Vietnamese music um, and Vietnamese singers and Vietnamese instruments and a combination of old French music as well from, from the 50s. So it might have appeared as though it was a Vietnamese composer, um, because Craig has a great ear and he combined a lot of, lo a lot of Vietnamese music and, and sounds into the score. So I take it as a compliment that you say that. Yes, it, it uh, provided a very great balance and especially for Vietnamese viewers. Right, we also had a wonderful uh, female singer who sort of became the voice of Vietnam uh, um, in the movie. Right. Now, uh, pro after this movie, did you anticipate an Oscar for it? Well, we didn't win an Oscar. We were nominated for an Oscar for Michael Caine. Um, you never anticipate anything like that. It, it's a gift. But um, um, so it didn't win an Oscar, but it was, but it was nominated. Right. Now, Hai Yin, who is one of the main characters in the film, um, I know she became quite a star here in Vietnam after The Quiet American. Um, what is it in her that you saw that particularly fit into the role of uh, Fung? Well, you know, uh, we needed a, a woman that would mesmerize Michael Caine. That's not easy to, to believe, given that he's married to one of the great enduring beauties of the world, Shakira, um, his wife. You know, so for the audience to believe that a guy like Michael is mesmerized by a woman, is, is hypnotized, you have to find a special woman. And Do Ti Hai Yen was a ballet dancer, classically trained. Her father is a, a singer uh, in North Vietnam. And so she had, uh, she had something very traditional fun. about her, you know, that's, like the ones in and, and that was a hard thing to find because uh, what I discovered looking all over Vietnam, even eight years ago, was that the influence of Western media had been felt even in the way people walked and moved, you know, that, that, that uh, Vietnamese women had, young women had, already undergone a lot of changes uh, due to, you know, the things that they'd seen in, on television and in movies, in magazines and so on. And, and so it was hard at first to find a woman that, that had a certain old-fashioned quality. And, and that was Do Ti Hai Yen. Uh, and probably it came from uh, the fact that she had been cloistered away in a ballet school since a young age. She hadn't seen a lot of things, and also she had had to discipline her body and her movements and everything as a ballet as a ballet dancer. Um, so, so, so that 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 was the reason. Also, she was a great actress, as she's gone on to 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 show us. Exactly, and I understand that you uh, still keep contact. You saw her again yes. this time yes, yes. coming to. Well, Vietnam. you know, she uh, and I have emailed over the years, and. I followed her uh, career from a distance and uh, she's always keeping me up to date with what's happening and she came to Australia with, uh, with her husband a few years ago and spent some time there 
um, with me uh, and, a, and a husband. Um, and so it's been, a great, it's been great to come back and see her now. She's grown from a child to a woman, um, to a complete woman, a mature woman, uh, uh, in, in so many ways. And it's great to see her, her, her career uh, prospering. You know. And now she's going on to even more complicated uh, roles and characters as in the new film, which opens soon, uh, A Floating World, you know, which is marvelous. Now, talking about Hai Yin, we know that at this uh, Vietnam International Film Festival, Hai Yin and uh, Philip Noyce saw each other again. They were reunited uh, after some years. So we'll take a look at some footages of them seeing each other. Philip Noyce has been to Vietnam 12 times. This time, he came to Hanoi to chair the first ever Vietnam International Film Festival and also for another purpose. This time it was a chance to meet all the people that I work with on The Quiet American again, to, to be reunited with old friends and colleagues, and also to bring my new family to experience Vietnam with me. Hai Yen, who played Phuong in The Quiet American, was among those he yearned to meet the most. The 19-year-old girl who acted for the first time in a film is now a famous actress, starring in various award-winning blockbusters in Vietnam. Yen is grateful for the experience she had with the big daddy. Lúc trước thì Yến học múa ballet và thực ra là Yến chỉ có bắt đầu cảm thấy là mình yêu điện ảnh và mình muốn theo cái nghề này từ sau khi phim người Mỹ trầm lặng. Và ông Philip là người dìu dắt và dạy dỗ Yến từ những bước đầu và đến bây giờ thì ông cũng luôn luôn cho những lời khuyên tốt nhất để cho những công việc của Yến. Presenting at the premiere screening of the film Floating Lives, <laughs> Philip Noyce was more than happy to praise the beautiful acting of his daughter. It was great to see uh, my daughter of sorts, uh, my protege, uh, Doti Haiyan, to watch her now as a mature actress. That was very moving. Haiyan was uh, very realistic, like all of the actors in the film. You know, you believed the emotions, you believed what was happening to them. Uh, you know, she's really matured. Thực ra thì khi mà Yến gặp lại ông Philip hôm mà ông Philip đến, thì ông Philip có nói là khi mà ông Philip đợi ở sân bay thì có xem cái trailer phim Cánh đồng bất tận. Và hỏi Yến là tại sao mà đóng cái vai thì mà vất vả và khổ quá. Yến bảo là đóng cái vai đó là bởi vì tại ông đưa Yến vào cái nghề này. Đặng Nhật Minh is another friend of the famous director. Selected by Philip Noyce as the most talented director, along with Ang Lee of China, at the Sydney Film Festival in 1994, Ming has become a close friend and colleague of his. Philip trusted Ming enough to assign him as the second unit director in The Quiet American. Cách đây 7 năm thì tôi có cái may mắn là được là làm việc với chung với Philip Noyce với tư cách là đạo diễn của đội quay thứ hai. Các cái phim Mỹ thì bao giờ nó có hai đội, một đội quay chính và đội quay phụ. Thế thì tôi rất là phải gọi đây là một cái dịp may mắn rất lớn trong cuộc đời làm nghề nghệ thuật của tôi. Cái lớn nhất mà cái ấn tượng tôi đối với ông Philip Noy là ông có một cái trái tim lớn, cái cái, cái lòng nhân ái, cái, cái tình thương yêu đối với con người thì tôi thấy là ông này vô cùng. Mà cái nghề đạo diễn này cái đó lại là rất quan trọng hơn cả những chuyện nghề nghiệp cơ. Và ông trong đoàn làm phim ông quan tâm hết tất cả mọi người từ người quan thành phần chủ yếu cho đến những người là, 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 là làm những công việc bình thường nhất trong đoàn ông đều quan tâm và truyền cho họ một cái ngọn lửa để tất cả mọi người cùng lấy cái đích cuối cùng là cái bộ phim thì cái điều đó là làm tôi thấy ấn tượng và có một cái ấn tượng nhất là ông rất yêu cái con người đất nước Việt Nam cái tình yêu của ông ấy thì đúng là vô cùng cảm động. Well, talking about uh, uh, your visit this time to uh, Vietnam, you're attending the judging panel at the uh, Vietnam International Film Festival. How did that come to be? I've kept in contact with the various people here in the film scene, and uh, uh, um, Mrs. Hong Yat uh, 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 from the Cinema Association um, was kind enough to to, to uh, recommend to the festival that maybe I, I would, would like to come back and, and take part uh, uh, in the festival. So, so it was through ongoing and, but distant uh, letter and email relationships uh, that I developed during the making of The Quiet American. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I moved everything out of the way, almost. I'm still working on a project here in the hotel upstairs in between watching the movies but 
I moved everything out of the way for the opportunity to come back, particularly to be a part of something that's just beginning. Uh, the, the, the Vietnamese International Film Festival, a very important event, I think, cultural event, uh, as we, we will see in the years to come, and being on the jury of the very first uh, Vietnamese International Film Festival was a great honor to be there at the beginning of something. Hey, would you say in the 10 movies that you saw and also in your time here uh, at the film festival, would you say you've discovered any talents? Absolutely. You know, uh, the last time I was the president of a jury was in Sydney in 1994. And uh, there, there were two filmmakers that we discovered. One was called Ang Lee, uh, who had his eat, drink, man, woman there and then went on to, to great heights um, in America um, and, and, and was nominated for an Oscar. Um, and the other one was somebody that was even uh, uh, more of a surprise. And that was a film that was at that festival that we gave a special jury prize to, and that was Danyat Min's um, um, a film, The Return. So on that occasion, you know, I was lucky to discover two great filmmakers. And I think uh, on this occasion, I've been lucky to discover another couple of great filmmakers. And I think uh, that the winner of the first Vietnam International Film Festival uh, is, uh, will be uh, a filmmaker who will be uh, uh, heralded a lot in the future. And I think that this festival will be able to say that it really made a, a great discovery. Mm -hmm. Now, among uh, the uh, films that you saw this time, you mentioned Floating Lives, uh, which Do Thi Hai is a part of. What do you think of the film? Floating Lives, it's beautiful. It reminds me, there's an American director, Terence Malick, who years ago made a wonderful film with Sissy Spacek. Um, um, I forget the name of the film. No, Badlands. Badlands. Um, and uh, this movie reminded me of, of that. You know, it was a road movie, a journey. In a way, this is a road movie. It's a boat movie. The boat moving across the badlands, the backwaters of uh, of Vietnam. Um, you know, it's a. It, it, one, it was wonderfully a beautiful film to watch. Um, it was um, confronting in a very good way. You know, um, and um, great actors. You know, I, I was really impressed by the movie and I hope it goes on to do really well at the box office here in Vietnam. You know, that's the biggest change in the eight years. Eight years ago when we bought The Quiet American, it was one of the first films to have a cinema release around Vietnam. Um, you know, they, they put it out uh, in, in what was then the first multiplexes. Well, they weren't even multiplexes. It was one cinema in Saigon and one in, in Hanoi and one in Da Nang and so on there was very little audience actually going to the cinema at that time eight years ago most people were watching films on television or buying pirate copies and watching at home now of course there's multiplexes all over vietnam uh, a megastar here in hanoi and, and, and in every one of the major cities and Viet young vietnamese people are flocking to the cinema so it's possible for a film like floating lives maybe maybe to earn its money back just from in Vietnam. I do think that, you know, with 90 million people in this country, with uh, many more cinemas being built, the future for the, for the Vietnamese cinema is very rosy, you know, because in, 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 I'm a citizen of America and of Australia. In Australia, we have 23 million people. Mm. So when we make a film, it's impossible for us to get the money back from inside Australia. We have to sell it to, every other, to all these other countries. In Vietnam, with between 80 and 90 million people, you can have a cinema that is able to, to be funded just from local sales. Uh, there's a lot of potential for the future. Huge potential. Where do you see Vietnam on the map of movies right now, the world the, map of movies? The, 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 the position is uh, anything is possible. You know, anything is possible because of the large number of people, because of emerging technology, because of the filmmakers that are emerging, um, you know, because of the, the enormous training that's been put into the movie industry with technicians, directors, writers and actors. You know, you have all the ingredients and now you've got the last one, which is the eco ec economic possibilities.
to actually have a successful cinema. And not dependent on America, not dependent on any other country, entirely dependent on local, local uh, response. What advice would you have for film directors in order to kind of catch up with other giants in the area, say China or uh, Republic of Korea? I think, I, I can't say what, uh, you know, there's no prescription. Um, um, all you can do is give your home remedy. Um, my home remedy is that uh, don't make a movie that you don't want to see yourself. Yeah. Don't make a movie because if you if you can't enjoy your own movie, then nobody else will. Exactly. You know, you, it must be a story that you love. The characters you're going to spend time with for two years when you're making them, or even longer, between writing and planning and then editing and then afterwards. And as a filmmaker, you're going to live with those characters, like Fung in Quite American or Fowler in The Quiet American, I live with them. They're like my children. I'll take them to the grave. So I'd better like them. I'd better like them. And, and if I don't, the audience will never enjoy the movie. Mm -hmm. So my advice is make movies you want to see. Don't make movies that you think others want to see but you don't want to see. Mm -hmm. Because then, uh, you know, you, 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 it won't, you, there'll be no joy in your film. For the first time, about 50 young Vietnamese filmmakers had a chance to talk to the world-acclaimed director Philip Noyes at a two-day workshop in Hanoi. Having spent more than 30 years making films, he was determined to pass on his experience and inspiration to the younger generation. Tôi thì lúc nào cũng mong muốn những cái cơ hội rất là tốt để các hội viên, các đạo diễn của điện ảnh Việt Nam được tiếp cận với điện ảnh thế giới. Thế và tôi đã gửi thư cho ông và nhân cái chuyến đi này, ông có thể bớt chút một tuần ở lại thêm Việt Nam để giảng dạy cho các đạo diễn, các sinh viên Việt Nam được không? Thì ông rất là sẵn lòng. Tôi nghĩ rằng đây cũng là do cái mối quan hệ rất là tốt bởi vì không chỉ ông yêu Việt Nam mà giữa tôi và đạo diễn Philip Noy đã biết nhau từ 15 năm trước khi chuyến ông sang Việt Nam lần đầu tiên ông đến thăm hãng phim truyện Việt Nam. With a friendly manner, Philip shared the journey of his own life from making low-cost underground movies to major films. Whatever it was, it is easy to admire at his endless passion, which could turn the impossible into financially successful films. Đạo diễn Philip Noy cũng là một đạo diễn khá nổi tiếng của Mỹ và một trong những lý do là ông ấy đã từng sang Việt Nam làm phim và mình muốn ông có ông ấy có nên có sự hiểu biết về điện ảnh Việt Nam cũng như điện ảnh Mỹ có khả năng tạo sự gần gũi với mọi người xung quanh rất nhanh ví dụ như cái bài tập buổi sáng khi đạo diễn đến thì đạo diễn cho mọi người ra sân vận động. And the message he was trying to convey was appealing to the participants. Ông Philip Nam đã cho mình biết một những cái điều mà cái quan trọng nhất là khán giả phải tiếp tục tiếp nhận cái phim của mình chứ không phải là mình làm phim ra để mình một mình mình xem. After the workshop in Hanoi, Philip also had another training program implemented in Ho Chi Minh City to complete his task as filmmaking inspiration in Vietnam. Talking about the movies that you do you like that you have? Um, take, look, looking back now on the movies that you have done, there's Bone Collector, um, there's Patriot Games, uh, Clear and Present Danger, uh, which all kind of surround uh, around the subject of political thriller and uh, subjects surrounding spies. Um, uh -huh. So, uh, w how did th this uh, passion come to be? Well, my father was um, was a, a spy trainer, um, uh, so um, I was brought up on his stories. He was um, in the Australian equivalent of the American OSS, which was the forerunner of the CIA. During the Second World War, he was training people in the islands of Australia. And after I made The Quiet American, and he saw it, he told me something quite amazing. He said, you know, one of the guys that I was training there, and he was training them to go behind the Japanese lines and to fight uh, guerrilla war. So he said one of the guys came to me and said, who he thought came from somewhere in this area, but he didn't, he didn't know because at that time, you know, we, in the world, the, the word Vietnam wasn't used. It was, Vietnam was a French possession. It was French Indochina, you know. 
So this guy came and said, I don't, I want to learn how to, how to uh, fight, but I don't want, I'm not, I'm not worried about fighting Japanese, it's the French that I want to fight. So my father realized that he was training a Vietnamese man to go home and to, to fight in, in the Vietnamese Revolution. But so he, he, he brought me up on stories of subterfuge, on stories of sabotage, on stories of secret uh, um, assassinations. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these were very romantic stories because in that war, you know, we won the war and it seemed as though the enemy needed to be defeated. It was not, it was a very, I'm talking about the Second World War, not the American War. And um, um, so I was brought up on those stories. So when I went to Hollywood, you know, and they gave me scripts to read, naturally I kept uh, saying yes to these scripts that repeated the kind of romantic stories that my father had told me. So I made one spy film after another, from uh, um, Patriot Games to um, Clear and Present Danger, uh, The Quiet American, and all the way through to Angelina Jolie's film, Soul. All of these spy movies. Now you just mentioned Salt, uh, starring the wonderful Angelina Jolie. Uh, I know that Salt came out at a time when actually the United States uh, deported some of the Russian spies. So were you amused by this coincidence? Well, no, they, they were all working for us, those spies. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were actors. It was a publicity stunt. Oh, well, that's interesting to know because uh, it you came don't think up... that Hollywood's just going to sit there and let people say that the movie this movie is not possible. No, we hired a lot of actors. Those Russians, they come cheap, you know. And we paid them and we got the FBI, they arrested them, they sent them back. Now they're back in America, they're continuing their life. No, I'm kidding. It was well, well done because we all believed it. Uh, yeah, no, uh, it was fantastic uh, coincidence. Very lucky for the movie, of course. But it wasn't a surprise. The only thing that was surprising was that it didn't happen earlier. Because all of the research that I did pointed to the obvious fact that, of course, if you're a spy, you don't go to the border of a, of a country and announce yourself. Mm -hmm. You go in and you pretend to be one of the people that you're spying on. So it wasn't a surprise that these people were arrested. Salt came out after um, some years, which you took off. Uh, you, you hadn't done a movie in quite a while. Um, did you take that time off to spend with your family, or? It, it wasn't. It wasn't that I took uh, time off uh, from making movies. It was that I took time off from making mainstream Hollywood movies. Um, in uh, 2000, after I made The Bone Collector with Angelina Jolie, I decided to take a break from from. Uh, big studio films and I went back to Australia where I made three films in, a d in tw 10 years. First of all, Rabbit Proof Fence, mm -hmm. then The Quiet American which we shot here mm -hmm. and in Australia and then finally a film that I made in South Africa called, called uh, Catch a Fire. So I continued to make movies, I just made a different kind of movie. Mm, okay. 
Um, now, in, in the opening night of the Vietnam International Film Festival here in the country, we uh, saw you with your wife and your little boy. Do, you, do they often travel with you when you yes, go around the world? Yes, we are everywhere together. Um, my son is uh, Lou Voyo, and he's uh, two and a half years old. I met my wife, uh, Voyo, while I was in South Africa making uh, um, um, Catch a Fire. And uh, we have another uh, little baby coming in January. We think it's a girl. Congratulations. Thank you. And um, so, so, you know, yeah, we, we stick together. It's, it's a very difficult life uh, for families working in the cinema. It's exciting in one way because you're always going to different places of necessity to make films, to go to film festivals and so on. But it's a, it's a, it's a problem for a family. So the only way around that is to make certain that the family goes everywhere. Well, at this uh, Vietnam International Film Festival, what do you think in general now about the organization um, of the film festival, being it the first one? Well, the film festival, whether it's the first or the, or the hundreds, has been very well organized. You know, it's just gone very, very smoothly. Um, of course, a film festival is about people and people's interaction and and uh, you know it can't be run like a Swiss clock uh, otherwise it, 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 it has no spirit, it has no heart. Things have to happen, things have to change day to day, hour to hour in order for there to be interaction between people, in order for people to discuss the movies, in order for there to be you know uh, events that can run longer or shorter. You know it's a, it's a living organism, a film festival. Um, because a film festival is about the people watching and then interacting with each other, you know. Um, so this festival has been as pleasant and as uh, and, and as efficient as any that I've that I've been been at. So we could look forward to you coming back again to Vietnam for the next festival. Hopefully. If I'm invited, as long as the the, the growing family can come, I'll be back. <laughs> but what we look forward to welcoming you back. Um, now the last question, which I'm sure a lot of audience are uh, um, curious about, that's after Salt, what's next? Well, you know, there's a number of films uh, that I'm thinking about at the moment. One of them is a love story. It's called Timeless. It's about a man who builds a, a machine that will allow him to go back in time, mm. to be reunited with his loved one that is lost in an accident. Um, there's a, a love story set in Prague, which is another spy story. And then there's another love story set in Australia, which would star Russell Crowe. But, you know, our, now is the time of trying to bring the elements together. The elements being, one, the script that, you, that you're happy with, mm -hmm. the actors that want to play in that script, and then finding somebody who's crazy enough to give you the money mm -hmm. to make the movie. So, so you need all three, the script, the actors, and then the money. And often you can have a good script, great actors, but no money. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have the money before you have the script. Mm -hmm. you know, but really you need all three. Well, we wish you all the best in your endeavors, and we hope to welcome you, your wife, your son, and also your daughter uh, back here to the country for another film festival. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this edition of Top Vietnam. We talked with the acclaimed filmmaker, Mr. Philip Noyce. Thank you very much. We'll talk more next time.